1 Kings 20 for our scripture reading. We are going to read the first four verses of 1 Kings 20. I will begin on one, join me on two, I'll read three, and we'll end together reading verse four. All right, so I'll begin on verse one. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, and I'll begin on one. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful music today and for the good, good spirit that's in this place. And Lord, we're, we're asking you now that you would make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word this morning. Thank you for each one that's made their way here to this service. And uh, Lord, I pray that you're ministering to their heart. And give each of us just exactly what we need today from you. Bless the special, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I was drifting away on life's petty sea, and the angry waves threatened my ruin to be. When away at my side, there I dimly descried a stately old vessel, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, ship ahoy. Twas the old ship of Zion, the sailing along, all aboard her seemed joyous, I heard their sweet song, and the captain's kind ear, ever ready to hear, caught my wail of distress as I cried out in fear. Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, as I cried out and fear, ship ahoy. The good captain commanded a boat to be lowered, and with tender compassion, he took me on board, and I'm happy today. All my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior, and now I can say, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. From my soul I can say, Bless the Lord. Oh, soul sinking down, knee sin's merciless wave. The strong arm of our captain is mighty to save. Then trust him today, no longer delay. Board that old ship of Zion and shout on your way. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout and sing on your way, Jesus saves. Amen. Hey, 
That's good. Amen. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. And I pray, God, that you would speak to hearts as only you can. I'm praying, God, that you'll help each of us to focus this morning and concentrate, give you our undivided attention as we open up the only book you've ever written. We want to thank you for the Bible today. We want to thank you for the Holy Spirit of God. I pray that he will be the teacher this morning and that he'll minister to your people as only he can do. So Father, have your way in these next few moments and may your will be done in each of our hearts and lives. May holy decisions be made for you today. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> if you open your Bibles again to 1 Kings 20. <clears throat> Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has attacked Israel. And he sends messengers to the king of Israel, which is Ahab, and basically says, all that you have is mine. Um, your gold, your silver, your wives, your children, everything. And notice what Ahab replies to him in verse number 4. Ahab said, My Lord, O king, according to thy saying, notice, I am thine and all that I have. What Ahab was telling to Ben-Hadab was, I absolutely surrender to you. What you have said is true. <clears throat> I think of Abraham. God asking him to take his son, his only son Isaac, and take him up to Mount Moriah and to offer him there as a sacrifice to God. What was God really asking Abraham for? Absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, God had told him, you can eat freely of all the trees of the garden, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. What God was asking them to do would be absolutely be surrendered to me. Let me be in control. What was the devil really trying to do when he tempted Adam and Eve? Is to not let God be in control, you be in control. Do not be absolutely surrendered to Him. Could I get some air going here? Somebody who knows how to do these fans. Would you get them going please? Um, Jesus said to His disciples, If any man doesn't deny himself, take up his cross daily, and forsake all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. What was Jesus asking for? Absolute surrender. Peter... Lovest thou me more than these? What was Jesus asking for? Absolute surrender. I'm saying this morning, what lacks in many people's lives is absolute surrender to God. Why many do not see the power of God in their life like they ought to is because they lack absolute surrender to God. Why many do not see answers to prayer in their life is because they do not have absolute surrender to God. Why many live in bondage to, to sin, or bondage to affliction, to, to addiction, or, or stubborn habits, is because of a lack of absolute surrender to God. Why many do not grow spiritually is because of a lack of absolute surrender to God. Ahab said to Ben-Hadad, he said, I am thine and all that I have. Let me ask you a question this morning, Christian. Have you ever uttered those words to God? Have you ever on your knees before God said, God, I am thine and all that I have? Have you ever absolutely surrendered to God? Understand something this morning. I'm not asking for commitment and neither is God. Commitment is far different than surrender. Commitment is a promise. 
an obligation or a pledge. In other words, it's, 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 it, I have control over that. Anytime you make a commitment, you're controlling the commitment. Surrender, you're giving up control. Surrender is when you give up or hand over to another person absolute control. So, commitment is where I keep in control, but surrender is where I give up control. And I completely submit myself to someone else's control. That's surrender. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, back when it was a Salvation Army, asked the secret of the success, and he said, God has had all of William Booth that there was. Absolute surrender. Dr. R. A. Torrey said this about D. L. Moody. Thousands and tens of thousands of men and women in God's work, brilliant men and brilliant women, gifted men and gifted women, talented men and talented women who have made great sacrifices, yet who nonetheless have stopped short of absolute surrender to God. Therefore, they've stopped short of absolute surrender. Power. Mr. Moody did not stop short of absolute surrender to God. He was a holy, surrendered man. Take your Bible with me and go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Would you look there please? 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter 2, Verse number 21. The Bible says, Even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. Who, when He was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. When it, when it says Jesus Christ committed himself to the one who judges righteously, you know what that means? It means he gave up control to the one who judges righteously. Have you ever given up control in your life? Have you ever absolutely surrendered to God? So many things control us. Work controls us. Pleasure controls us. Self controls us. Money controls us. Sports controls us. <clears throat> Pleasing man controls us. Ambition controls us. Habits control us. But God will never use you in a great way. Until He has full control in our life. Until we give Him absolute surrender. The key to blessedness. Listen, the key to happiness. The key to fulfillment in life is when you absolutely surrender to God. Full surrender. Have you ever done that? Oh, I didn't ask, I didn't ask if you were saved. I hope you are. And if somebody asks you if you're saved and they ask, well, when did that take place? I hope you can tell them when it took place. And, and you may not know the exact day. You may not know the exact hour. But like the old songwriter said, I was there when it happened and I ought to know. And so you were there when it happened. You ought to know that you've been born again. And I hope you can testify that you were saved this morning. But if someone asks you if you ever absolutely, totally surrendered your life to God, what would you say? If, if we observed your life, if we just said, let's, let's, let's do a reality TV show about you, and we'll follow you with a camera crew for a week, would we conclude that, well, we can't put this person on television. They're absolutely surrendered to God. 
Is that what the conclusion would be? You see, when you yield control, the Bible becomes a different book. When you yield control, prayer is not just a necessity, it's a joy. When you yield control, you want to tell other people of Christ. When you yield control, you desire to be separate from the world and be as draw as close to God as you can. When you yield control, you want to be faithful to the things of God. When you yield control, it's a joy to give. It's a joy to, to, to give the Lord His tithe and to give an offering. It's a cheerful thing. The songwriter said, All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is that just an invitation song you know? Or is that a reality in your life? Have you ever absolutely surrendered to God? Have you ever said, I am thine and all that I have? Is yours. It's yours. Just two simple thoughts this morning. Number one, you cannot have God's all until He has your all. You cannot have God's all until He has your all. The first and greatest commandment Jesus said is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. What is he saying? He says, I want you to not, listen, I want you to love me with everything you have. All your mind, all your strength, everything, all of you. God is never content to have part of your heart, and part of your affections. He, he says, I want you to love me with everything you have. We desire God's power. We desire God's blessing. We desire His joy and His victory and wisdom and protection and His peace. And we say, God, I want everything that You have. But God looks down and says, but I'm asking You for everything You have. We say, well, God, I don't want to give You everything, but I sure want everything You have for me. And God says, I cannot give You everything I have until You give me everything You have. Do you understand? God responds to us. He said, you draw nigh to me. And what does God say? I will draw nigh to you. I just wish I felt closer to God. Well, the problem isn't on God's end. God's waiting for your heart's desire to say, I want to be close to you. And when you desire as much as you desire to breathe to be close to God, God says, I'll come nigh to you. <clears throat> You've longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot be blessed and have peace and sweet rest until all on the altar is laid. Then the songwriter asks the question, is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control? Those are questions that each of us need to ask ourselves this morning. One of the leading pastors in the Chinese church, basically the underground church there, made this statement, multitudes of church members in the West are satisfied with giving their minimum to God, not their maximum. Jesus gave His whole life for us and we give as little of our lives to Him as we can. We give as little of our time and money back to God as we can. What a disgrace. Repent. He's got a point. He's got a point. Can we really say, I'm absolutely surrendered to God and, and yet I can, I can hardly give Him one hour a week to come to church? 
Can I really say I'm absolutely surrendered to God when, when we say, yeah, but I just didn't have time to read the Bible today? George Mueller, upon whom God poured out abundant blessings in England, another generation. God used him in a mighty way. If you're not familiar with the story, he, in his lifetime, and, and back in the 1800s, he prayed in, uh, over the course of his lifetime, I think someone said nearly $7 million dollars. For orphanages, he cared for thousand, several thousand orphans at one time. And you know what? He never told anybody about his need. He made a promise to God. He would never tell anyone else. He would only tell God. And, and he, didn't, he didn't cheat and say, well, I'm not going to tell anyone else about my need, but I'll go to my millionaire friend here. You didn't know that, did you? Huh? Yeah. And I'll go to my millionaire friend and say, hey, Nathan, how are you doing today? Hey, I just want you to pray with me about this. You know, we really... We really need some money for food at the orphanage, and so I want you to pray with me about that. I'm not, I'm not asking him to pray with me. I'm asking him, give me money for the orphanage. Sometimes we're sharing prayer requests, but we're really asking that person to help us out. Okay, That's not what he did. He wouldn't tell anybody. He just told God. And God would bring it in time after time after time for George Mueller. George Mueller was 90 years old, said this about absolute surrender. He said, absolute surrender amounts to two things. One, absolute surrender to work what God wants us to do. In other words, an absolute surrender that I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do. There's a difference between doing what I want and doing what God wants. There's a difference between doing good will and doing God's will. Things can be good to do, but is it God's will for you to do it? Well, that's quiet. Secondly, Mueller said, it's a total willingness to let God work in us whatever He wants to work. You know, it's, it's one thing for you to say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. It's another thing for you to say, God, do in me whatever you want to do. A lot of us say, man, I'll do something for God, but I don't want God to do anything in me. I don't want Him changing my life. Can I remind you, without God, you wouldn't have a life? The Bible says they that live in pleasure are dead while they live. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without Him, we don't have life. We're dead while we live. Fanny Crosby was blind at just six weeks of age by the mistake of a doctor. And instead of wallowing in self-pity, she took it as from the Lord. Many of the songs in our hymn book, I am thine, O Lord. Jesus is tenderly calling to God be the glory, blessed assurance. On and on and on, thousands of hymns that she wrote. When Fanny Crosby was old, somebody told her that if she'd have been born in that day, that there's an operation that could have restored her sight. And Fanny Crosby said, oh no, she said, I wouldn't change anything. She said, do you realize that the first face I'll ever see will be the face of Jesus. He says, I wouldn't change anything of what God had for me. You see, the very first thing when it comes to absolute surrender is you can't have God's all till He has your all. And then let me say number two. You have to come to Christ on His terms. You must come to Christ on His terms. Jesus said, I am... The, the what? The way. Did He say, I'm a way? I'm one of the many ways? No, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man, no one comes to the Father but by Me. So when someone, I talk to somebody and ask them if they know if they're going to heaven when they die, and they say, well, God and, God and I have an understanding. No, you don't. Not trying to be mean, but I'm being honest. 
No, you don't. Because you don't come to God on your terms, you come to God on His terms. You don't set the terms. You see, we're, we're guilty. Okay? I, I won't embarrass the, the guys. There's, there's people in here who've been guilty of crimes. They stood before a judge and got sentenced. Danny, I'll point you out. Okay? People know your story. They know your testimony. Back 90, 97. When you went into court and stood before the judge and the judge is ready to pronounce sentence, he didn't say, Danny, what are your terms? What are your thoughts? What do you think you ought to do here? They don't ask those questions, do they? You know, you know what? And you didn't want to say anything. You know why? I'm guilty. I did wrong. Give me what I deserve. People who think they make agreement with God and get on terms with God are people who don't understand how guilty they are in the sight of God. You're not in position to cut a deal. People think, well, if I just go to church and try to live a good life and help others and maybe get baptized, I'll be okay. No, my friend, all you're trying to do is clean up a sinner. And, and, and you still got sin to deal with. What about sin? What are you going to do with your sin? God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Is God going to allow sin into heaven? He cannot and be God. So when people think that, well, you know what, I just think God's going to let everybody in. And if you think about that, then heaven would be just like earth. How many of you think this is heaven? Yeah. I've heard, I've heard people refer to it the other place, but it's not that place either. Wait till you die and go to hell. Oh, my friend, this is in heaven and God's not going to allow sin to enter into heaven. When people think they'll get in by being good or doing good works or by going to church, listen, they don't understand I have a sin problem that has to be dealt with. What do I do with these sins? Because baptism doesn't take them away and getting into church doesn't take them away and all the good deeds I do don't, don't take them away. What takes it away? Well, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus died on the cross and He shed His blood that we might have forgiveness of sin. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. He's the only one that can take your sins away. We're helpless sinners who must rely on a Savior. I cannot save myself. You cannot save yourself. You have to absolutely trust Christ and Him alone for salvation. It's, it's Jacob. Look at, look at Genesis 32. Will you please go back to Genesis 32. This is Jacob. Jacob has left Laban. And he's returning back home. But he hears that Esau is coming to get him as well. But in verse 22, it says, He rose up in that night, Genesis thirty-two twenty-two. 22, he rose up that night, took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the Ford Jabbok. That was one of the early model Fords of that day. But um, he, You might have heard of that Ford Jabbok. Um, but he, he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. Now, just keep that thought in mind a minute. I just want you to look may have turned a page, I don't know. Verse 7, notice what we know about Jacob. Jacob was greatly afraid and what? Distressed. And now you find out in verse 24, Jacob was left alone. And when he was left alone, there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. 
He had a wrestling match all night long. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And was out of his, and, the, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob. Jacob means supplanter, trickster. Jacob, the one who grabbed hold of his heel. <laughs> Jacob, the one who would, who would uh, cheat his brother out of the birthright. Uh, cheat his brother out of the blessing. Would go and then cheat his father-in-law. And, 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 and change it. he met his match with Laban. But uh, they went back and forth cheating each other. He said, no, it's not going to be Jacob anymore, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and hath, with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, what uh, th- thy name? And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Jacob met God that night. He was greatly distressed and afraid, and he was all alone. Sometimes God's got to put you in places where you have nowhere to look but up. Where you have nowhere to look but to Him. You ever... Maybe you're here this morning and you come to the end of yourself. Come to the, the, the end of carrying the load of your sin. If you're tired of the load of your sin, then why don't you let Jesus take care of it for you? Esau's closing in on him. The Lord is there. He couldn't go anywhere. For 20 years, he's bluffed his way through. For 20 years, Jacob has gotten by with cleverness, craftiness, scheming things. Just like some of you did. Got by just figuring it out. Making it work. But now he's in a place where he couldn't go anywhere. He can't go backwards and he can't go forward. And that night as the angel of the Lord wrestles with him and I think it was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. I think Jacob saw himself for what he really was. And all night long, the battle raged. Do you remember that battle in your soul? The battle inside of you before you came to Christ? This time, Jacob means business. He wanted deliverance. And the Lord was saying, Jacob, look at you. He asked him what his name was. He's reminding him, remember what you are, Jacob. Face the reality. Face the truth. You're the heel grabber. You're the one who cheats his brother. You're the one who, who, who cheats himself and tries to hide it from everybody's eyes. But Jacob, I see. Face the truth, Jacob, or there'll be no there'll be no victory for you at all. And until you come face to face with the reality that you are a hopeless, lost sinner in need of a Savior, you'll never be saved. You'll never be born again. As long as I excuse my actions, I justify my sins, I'll never know the forgiveness of God. But Christ delivered him that night. And, and he wasn't just interesting. By the way, he got a new name that night, didn't he? You know what happened when you got saved? You got a new name. What's your name now that you're saved? You're a Christian. You, Christ gives us His name to carry. And the Bible says that we ought to live up to that name. We ought not to drag that name through the mud. That's an important name we carry. But God wasn't just interested in changing His name, He was changing His character. Jacob would leave that night, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and as he left, it said he halted, he limped. And from that day forward, every time you saw Jacob, you saw him limping, and he remembered his encounter with God. His walk was never the same. 
When you meet Jesus Christ, your walk is never the same. You say, well, preacher, I, I prayed a prayer when I was a kid, or I prayed a prayer one time, and I asked Jesus to save me, but boy, I, 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 not, nothing really changed in my life. Well, you may not have met Jesus Christ. You may have just prayed a prayer. There ought to be, there ought to be absolute evidence in your life that you belong to Jesus Christ. Frances Havergale was staying in London in a home before she went there and she knew the arrangements that she was going to there were ten people in that home and she prayed that all ten of those people would know Christ as their Savior before she left. When she came to her last night there, there were still two that were not saved. Two daughters of the man of the house. And as she prayed that night, before she went to sleep, she prayed for their souls. And it was just a few hours into her sleep that the door opened to her room and someone shook her, on the, tapped her on the shoulder, and it was those two young ladies come to her room wanting to be saved. She gave the Gospel to them and they were both sweetly saved and her account, as she tells it, says they stayed up the rest of the night rejoicing. And it was then that Francis Havergal decided that I'm consecrating my life to Jesus Christ. This is, if this is what God will do, I want to do it all the time. And she penned the words, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. At the impulse of Thy love. She ended that song by saying, Take my love, my God, I pour at Thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever, only, all for Thee. Ever, only, all for Thee. Have you ever done that? You ever bowed your knee and said, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee? You'll never have His all till you give Him your all. And you come to God on His terms, not your terms. God gave His all for you. Shouldn't you give your all to Him? Andrew Murray said, God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life wholly yielded to Him. Did you get that? God is ready to assume full responsibility to the life for the life that's wholly yielded to Him. I was eighteen years of age in the Young People's Department at Canton Baptist Temple. Chapel One, where they used to meet over there. Dave Yoder knows it well. It was January. Just a cold January morning in northeastern Ohio. Family got up and got ready. It was Sunday. We go to church. And I thank God that I, that I had a dad who we never had to ask, are we going today? Sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, the Pope's Catholic, and we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Just the way it was. I thank God for that. Don't, don't buy into that. And listen, don't buy into this stuff. Well, my parents forced me to go to church when I was a kid, so I don't want to go anymore. That's not true. My parents forced me to go when I was a kid too, and I still go. I go to church every day of the week. And I don't have to, I want to. Now the truth is, you don't want to go to church because your heart's wicked. And you're not, you're not concerned about pleasing God. 
I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm being honest. That morning went to church, and that morning there was a guest preacher who was preaching in the college and career class that morning. And in Camp Baptist Temple, um, at that time, they had portraits throughout the hallways. It's a large church. And in those days, it wasn't unusual to have 4,000 people on Sunday in church. Probably, I'm thinking there were 300, 350 in our college and career class. And the guest preacher that morning was talking about the portraits that hung throughout the hallways. They called it, the, Dr. Henniger started that years ago. He, he got inspired by the Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, and he said, we ought to have a Christian Hall of Fame. And so different ones who God used in a great way uh, in their life, he would get their portrait painted and then give a brief description of what God did in their, through their life. And you can walk through the hallways and just read about these great men of God. And that morning, that guest preacher preached and he's preaching about the Hall of Fame out there and those men. And he said, you know, they all, they all have one thing in common. He said, they're all dead. They're all gone. He said, who's going to consecrate their life to be in the next Hall of Fame? Who will surrender their life for God to use them like those people surrender to God to use them? And he preached an outline that morning and he said, God needs men. And he preached on that for a while. And then he said, my second point is, God needs men. Then his third point was, God needs men. Real complicated outline, wasn't it? But boy, when he said, God needs men! He said, God needs men that will yield to Him and men that will consecrate themselves to Him. Men that will say, I am Thine and all that I have. And I don't know if you've ever been in a service like that before. you ever been in a service where you felt like no one else was there and He was just preaching to you? That's the way it was that morning. Boy, when the invitation was given, I was out of my seat and down at the altar. Prayed at that altar. I said, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I don't know what that means. But I'm thine and all that I have. That was a couple years ago. It's been a while. But I'll testify to you today, God assumes full responsibility for the life that is completely yielded to Him. Have you ever surrendered all to Him? Have you ever said, God, I am Thine and all that I have? Where are the next, where are the next missionaries going to come from? Where are the next pastors and evangelists going to come from if they don't come from people in this room and people in churches like ours where are they going to come from there used to be some young people that will say I am thine and all that I have God I don't I don't want to spend my life being a success at something that doesn't matter Go ahead and, and work and, and say, hey, I'm going to build a company and I'm going to be a millionaire and I'm going to make lots of money. And as soon as you retire, as soon as you're done, you know what? A new name's going on the door and you're pretty much forgotten. Only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Isn't there somebody in the room who has something burning in their heart to say, I want to do something for God with my life. I want to see what God would do with me. Would you just bow your knee today and say, God, I don't know what it'll be. I don't know what you'll have me do. But today, on October 15th, 2017, I am thine and all that I have. 
take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. I'm so thankful that I was in church on that January morning Nineteen hundred and seventy seven. So thankful that I said you can have all of me. Oh, I've I've failed you so many times. But you've never failed me. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, as you touched my heart that morning. I ask you to touch some hearts of people this morning. I just believe there's some young people who ought to say, I'm thine and all that I have, Lord. Do something great with my life. I not only surrender to do what you want me to do, but I'll surrender to allow you to do in me what you want to do in me. Raise up another Dwight Moody out of this church. Raise up another William Carey out of this church. Lord, I pray you've dealt with people's hearts. And there'll be dozens of people in this room today who would say, Preacher, I'll bow them my knee. I'll bow the knee and say, I am thine, Lord, and all that I have. I will say, not just sing a song, but I will say as a prayer, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. I will yield, I will give absolute surrender to God. Give up control of my life to His control. Please, work in hearts as only you can. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks in the room today would say, first of all, Pastor, I knew, you know, you talked about being a sinner who needs a Savior. There's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner and I knew I needed a Savior. And I cried out to Jesus and I asked Him to be my Savior. And Pastor, I know today beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know that I have eternal life. I know that I'm saved. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you hold it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I, I cannot say with assurance that if I died, I'd go to heaven. But Pastor, I'm concerned about it today. Would you let me pray for you? Not embarrass you and not call you out, but I will pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down and say, pray for me this morning? Say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not saved. I, I, I don't think Christ is my Savior. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Is there someone like that? You couldn't raise your hand the first time, but you raised it this time. Will you do it? Let me pray for you. Thank you. Please don't die and go to hell when you had every opportunity to be saved. Please don't do that. You'll forever hear the messages that you're hearing and that you've heard. I think you'll hear them over and over again as you burn in hell. I think that'll be part of the torment you'll go through. My friend, don't, don't do that. Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. No matter what the problem is, no matter what you think would keep you from Christ, just give it to Him. He'll take care of it. Now I wonder how many believers here today, and that's who the message was to. I wonder how many believers today would say, I am thine and all that I have. I wonder how many of you today would say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever consecrated my life. I don't know that I've ever absolutely surrendered my life to God. I, I, I still... 
I still have control. I have not yielded complete control to Him. I don't know that I've ever said those words to God. I am thine and all that I have. Absolute surrender. To let Him be in control. I wonder how many folks here would say, Pastor, today's the day. I consecrate myself to God. Pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. It's all right. I don't want you to make a quick decision. I just want you to, if the Lord's speaking to your heart, then obey Him. Obey Him. Before I close in prayer, before we have our invitation, is there anybody else would say, Pastor, include me in your prayer. Today I'm going to consecrate myself to God. Young people, are you listening? Are you listening to God? In a moment I'm going to pray and then when I'm done praying we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play. Brother Bob will sing. We'll have our invitation. If you'll consecrate your life to God today you need to come to the altar. Consecrate it to the Lord. If you're saying I am thine and all that I have then you ought to make it public. Just get my attention. We'll have someone fill a card out on you. And we'll tell the folks what you're doing. That'll help you. It'll cause you not to go back on your decision. It'll help you to stay firm. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. We're asking that your will be done now in every heart and life. I'm praying that each one who said they would consecrate themselves to you today would do it. What you could do with just the people in this room would be amazing. You took 12 men and turned the world upside down. Hard to say what you could do with 100 people who are totally, completely surrendered to you. Have your way in each heart during this invitation now. May thy will be done. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning. That's right. Take my life and let it be. That's right. Consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love and the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my king Always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages for Thee. Take my silver and my gold, Not a might would I withhold, Not a might would I withhold. Take my love, my God, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Ever only
Number 39 in the book. Would you get that out, please? Number 39. Let's sing it as our... Make it a prayer to God, will you please? Not just words on a page, but ask God to make it the prayer from your heart. Sing it together, all right? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee.